Now, if you look at moon phase, and once again, just when I think I know everything and I'm getting ready to be done with it all, I have to learn something. Chad and I went out. Guaranteed Chad, Chad, I'm going to get you a big night walleye. We're going to go four to five days after the full moon. We're going to do it. We went out and nothing happened. First time in my several years, temperature's right, moon phase is right, and there's no fish. They've done several st studies, and they've found that the new moon is the best. And what you're going to read is it's going to say, when you go out on a full moon, some say that it is better at night, or it's better in the day. If I have clear water, and I've got, I don't like fishing right on the full moon, we never have best luck then. But if I'm fishing that waxing or waning period where I'm dealing with partial moons, in the clear water, it's always going to be better at night. Reason being, it's clear and the moon can do what? Put light in the water. In a lake that's dirty, it's going to have to be completely full. And this thing came this year, it happened. We went out and we went out on dark moons. We did all kinds of crazy stuff and caught fish in the weirdest times. But what happened, like I was telling Chad, when you guys saw us go out with John from Tolbers and get that 16 pounder last season, it had been raining and cloudy. And the sun, or the sun, the sun, the moon was breaking in and out of the clouds as it was raining. And what actually happened with Chad and I is we had no cloud cover at all. And in my opinion, there was too much light on the water, even at night. That's how sensitive their eyes are. Once that moon dropped down, and we were going out there when it was dark, we were catching fish. Because this moon phase that we hit last fall, we didn't have any cloud cover at night. It's one of the first years where we hadn't had any cloud cover at night. And it just blew me away, like, I can't believe they are that sensitive, even with moonlight. It tells you how well they can see. Now, when we get down to, you know, we've covered the mud lines, we've covered the wave action on the surface, we've covered it going in with the stand and the, and the clear. Now, when you guys, when you, when you get into muddy water, which you're not going to find, around here it's difficult, you're not going to really find the muddy water. But what happens with the mud is they'll be shallow all day long. They'll be up there shallow all day long. Now, what you have to keep in mind, like when we talked about in the wintertime, blow my nose again. In the wintertime, guys, the only thing that I've ever found that will make them ignore the light is in the winter. If we came out of this cold front right now, and we had some 40 degree days, maybe two of them, maybe it got 39, whatever, 40, like when those pineapples come through, and we had some sun, we had that southern wind blowing, I would get right up on the shoreline, even this time of year. Because the only driving force that they'll bypass on their eyes is to get warm in order to feed. So in the winter time, that rule of the light and all that, that may not happen. Because they may get pushed up in there just to try to get warm. Now there's going to have to be a little chop on the water. If it's glassy flat, they won't be there. But if you got a little chop in the water, dead of the winter, they'll roll out of that 40, 60 feet, and they'll push right up on that shore just to get warm in order to feed. Um, when we think in terms of bait selections, um, like I said, we've got a whole pile of stuff here that we're going to cover. And what I want to do, guys, we've got about, oh, let's say about 20 minutes till our break. Is everybody familiar with tying the snail? What I want to do before I get into this, I'd like to take a second and have just groups here come up, the next group, the next group, to show you this knot. Because you're going to use this knot for doing this. See this triple set up here? You can do doubles, you can do singles, you can do whatever you want. Salmon steelhead rigs with it. The importance of it is, when you go buy a store-bought and leader, you're just getting line. What is it? Is it fluorocarbon? Is it whatever? You don't know. Typically, back before fluorocarbons came out, we'd tie with about eight pound test. 
Problem with that is you get a few fish going on these things and you're gonna have to start retying. So you were constantly making new ones. Now with fluorocarbons, 12, 15 pound test. They can't see it. So what I wanna do, and we've got the knot tying DVD where we cover this, but what I'd like to do before we get into all the baits is just show everybody how to tie this. I got a big hook, I got big rope. We'll just show you. Everybody come up and show you. Does that sound cool? Yeah. All right. Most common walleye lure in the world is what, Jim? A walleye spinner. I'll answer it for you. Jim's got the most incredible walleye spinner kit I've ever seen in my life. This is what everybody thinks of when they think of walleye, walleye fishing. Spinner rigs. I don't like spinner rigs, but I'm going to talk about them anyway. Here's what you got. It's just like all things, guys. Remember when I held up those frogs during the bass seminar? There was three different sizes, styles, fat, skinny. It's the same principle here. You'll go buy one of these, or you're going to make one now because I'm teaching you, and you better make them because you need to be custom. But what will happen, you'll go buy one, and you'll say, well, Seth said that red and green was what they see this thing. It's going to kill them. And you'll troll it all day long. You have to understand the differences here, because there's a lot. I could probably do two hours just on spinners. What we're going to do is give you an overview of it. What is a walleye spinner? Basically, we've got a blade. We've got either beads on here, make it glass or plastic, whatever you want. Glass clicks a little more, a little heavier though, so you can get down to the bottom with it. Or I've got what they call pills. These are basically foam floats. You go into the warehouse or in these places, you'll see them in the walleye section. Piles of different colors. What colors are we going to focus on? Reds and greens. Pretty much that's going to be handled for you because that's what's in there. But <clears throat> let's talk about the blades. You're going to go in there and you're going to see all different kinds of blades, you're going to go, oh, what did Seth say? What did he cover? Here's what you got to do. Oh, I lost my favorite blue pan. All right, guys. Let's talk blades. In clear water, when we talked about spinner baits, what was the best color of blade to run? Silver. Silver. Yeah, guys, listen, yes. Same principle there. Stained water. Gold, brass low light conditions. If we've got muddy situations, a real low light early in the morning, what's the next best color? Painted. Painted. Chartreuse. So that's kind of your basic outline of the color to choose. Now, you're going to be baffled by, you know, Jim pulls his out and he's got more blades than you can shake a stick at. There's just a lot of combinations and they, they all mean something. The first blade you're going to see is a Colorado blade. Most common, right here. The Colorado blade, and my expert drawing is not so good, but here's a Colorado blade, guys. Right here. Typically a fat, squatty blade. The next blade you're going to see will be an Indiana blade. Kind of fat and squatty, but a little skinnier and a little bit longer here. Holding it up here. The next blade you're going to see is a willow leaf blade. Looks like a willow leaf. Kind of fat in the center, pointed on both ends. Anybody see that? What kind of leaf? Willow leaf. Willow? Yes, sir. Willow. Yep. Willow leaf. Now the next one you're going to see, which is kind of the, the new guy, is a smile blade. Now if I was to draw this guy, basically looks like a boomerang. If you, if you say kind of something like this, if you will. And you got a hole right in here. Smile blade. Everybody see this? Get out of the way. It looks like a wing. Looks like a boomerang right there. We've got some up here. You guys want to look at them when we're done. You can come look at them. And then you're going to see a hatchet blade. See why I could spend like two hours on this stuff? 
Hatchet blade. The record fish, the 19, I believe it was. I may be off, maybe a little bigger than that, but it was caught on a smile blade. Smile blade is made out of mylar or plastic. It's flexible. These are made out of steel. Punched. What you need to keep in mind is not so much about, oh, that blade looks pretty or it's the right color. It's how does it function? What's its function? Colorado blade. If this is your fishing line, the angle at which that spins off of here is approximately 50 degrees. Wow, we're getting into some math now. An Indiana blade over here on the other hand, the angle at which it spins is 40 degrees. The willow leaf is 25 degrees from your line. Everybody see that? I don't mean a lot to you right now. This blade is variable. You can do whatever you want with it. It's plastic. We'll talk about it in a second. A hatchet blade is going to be somewhere in the middle. It spins fairly tight. It's just kind of a different look. I compare it more to one of these. It's kind of like this cut out with this and then it makes that. These two got together and they had this. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that happened. Okay. Hatchet blade. First time I ever saw one of these I was up in Canada. A place called Lesser Slave Lake. Oh, what is that? So I had to buy 40 of them. Here's what's important to you. Let's stick with these. Most common. Guys, when you go down to troll a spinner this time of year, I want you to use this one or this one. Reason being, at 50 degrees, I'm pushing more water because the blade is more upright, has more surface area, it allows me to go slower, slower. I can go slow with this. I can also go slow with this smile blade because if I have it spread out like that, I've got a lot of what surface area. I can take it if I want to speed it up and I can collapse it down, make it tighter, less surface area, spin faster. It's adjustable. The benefit of this is it doesn't weigh anything. I can go even slower. Speed control. That big wall, I was caught on that, and I wasn't with the guy that caught it, but I'm going to almost bet that that thing was pushed out almost flat so you could just chug along because it was cold water. They're not going to want to go a great distance because they're cold blooded. The Indiana blade, the hybrid of these two, here, a little less service area, it's going to go a little bit faster. In the summertime, if we're speed trolling down at Moses through the weeds, and we're in that post-spawn feeding frenzy, or even the pre-spawn feeding frenzy, we're using this. The same rule applies to picking spinner baits for bass. This bait, running closer to its axis, is pushing what? Less surface area, correct? Less surface area equals less lift. I control it faster with a lower amount of weight to keep it down there. It doesn't have as much drag. This one, on the other hand, if I speed it up, it's going to go try to burn a big spinnerbait that's got a Colorado through the water. It's pretty tough to do. You burn willow leaves. You slow roll or slow troll Colorados or possibly in Indiana. Like I said, this one you can do whatever you want with. <coughs> the other thing that happens, if it is <clears throat> muddy water and it's the peak period, and Seth said, well, I gotta troll fast. I gotta have one of these. Wrong. Wrong? What do you mean? Colorado has more surface area, correct? It's fatter, right? It's probably going to put off more what? Vibration. More thump. Walleyes like to feel vibration, correct? So if I was in muddy situations, 
I would run a chartreuse, Big Dish, Colorado. It's going to give me the thump down there. If I'm slow trolling, and I'm not going to be speed trolling in the mud because they got to be able to find it. If it goes blowing through there, they're going, I think I feel it. Oh, yeah, I feel it. You got to slow it down. Um, with these guys, you may go down to where you're just drifting, Mark, Brian. Just real slow drifting. I keep wanting you to call him. His, his business is Markham Homes. Jeez, I'll get it right, Brian, I promise. That's like two nights in a row. I just, I'm not calling you Steve or something. I'm in the neighborhood. So keep that in mind. I can go slow and I can create vibration. I want to go slow when it's cold and I got to have the vibration. So, okay. You go down tomorrow, and it's right now it's crystal clear. The fish aren't real aggressive. Well, Seth said that I should go with Colorado because I can go slow. And you go down there and you troll all day long and you don't get nothing, and then you come back and you're cussing Seth and you hate Seth and he's a liar and I wasted my money. Remember those frogs, how they were different? Different things? Same basic thing, right, but different. Right here, I can open this up to go slow, right? This probably doesn't quite thump like that, does it? Remember having rattles in the bait versus not? If they're not real aggressive, too much shake, rattle, and roll, pushes them off. Now I would go with this. Same thing in the summertime. You can smoke one of these through the water. Right here, squeeze it down. Not a lot of vibration. Maybe they just want the flash. The willow, it's going to be thumping. Not as much, but it's still going to be thumping through the water. So there may be a time when, this is what Seth told me, but I had some high pressure and the water was pretty flat. Maybe I should have went with this and speed trolled this because it's got less vibration. Just like a painted bait versus a transparent bait versus a chrome bait. Each one can perform at different times. You just have to be able to change it. Now you go to blade size. Right now, if you went down there, you're going to be using a, a 2 aught double zero, up to a size 1. That's small. Just a little bit of thump. But I have to have this on there to keep the bait lifted up as I move. If not, I'm going to be dragging in the bottom. That is unless I do what? I have these. These probably don't float, do they? Beads? This guy here, I told you it floated, right? Yeah. With this rig right here with the floats on it, and I open it up, I can go super slow. I'm more apt to troll faster with beads because I don't need to have the lift. Because the blade is creating the lift for me. So this rig right here would be super slow. Open that thing up. I got the pills on there, the floats, and I can chug along. No, it's going to go down on a wire harness rig. I'll show you. So everybody understand principle of blades. I don't want to take the whole thing on this, so I'm going to move forward here. 